اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا ابا القاسم محمد وعلى ال بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقيه الله روحي وارواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء the first of your loudest salawat in honor of the greatest man to walk this earth, Al Habibul Mustafa Muhammad. The second in honor of the greatest lady to walk this earth, Al Hawraul Batuli Fatima. And the third and your final salawat in honor of our Imam, Imam Sahib Al-Asri Wal-Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Over the course of the last two nights, we had a very brief look of the people known as the Khawarij, the people namely against the school of Ahlul Bayt, the people that attacked Islam in its early stages. And we looked at how it reflected the people that fight Islam nowadays under the same banner. Of Islam. Now, one thing that we did question is the concept and the faculty of knowledge. As in, we begin to question how is it that knowledge was given to them? How is it that they acquired knowledge? Where did they seek knowledge? And how did they incorporate it to their own lives? Therefore, the importance of tonight's topic, which will be analyzing the concept of knowledge, how to acquire knowledge, what are different types of knowledge will be over a course of two nights, insha'Allah. So I'd like to start by looking at knowledge. What does the Prophet of Islam say about knowledge? Very brief, very repetitive, but it's good for the remembrance. It will build the way up, insha'Allah, until we get to tomorrow night, in which we will talk about knowledge through the Imams. But we can't just talk about the miracles, which are in its ma most magnanimous nature, without laying down the foundations of how is it that these people achieved that which they achieved. How did they achieve the knowledge which they have? What have they done in order to acquire such high levels in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Therefore, tonight will be a very brief, very introductory topic for tomorrow night, which will be the gist of, to, of the topic and the faculty of knowledge. So inshallah, to help me start tonight's topic of knowledge, please raise your voices and allow salawat ala Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad. When we delve into the concept of knowledge, we find that the Prophet ﷺ has many a narration discussing the idea of knowledge and its importance. As an example, we have a narration by the Prophet of Islam in which he states, Make sure that you go and acquire knowledge even if it takes you as far as going towards China. Go even if it takes you as far as China. Put it into that context. China was looked at to be a very far place. Just like in the idea that we are given in Islamic thought and in the stories that we have, when they mention 1,000, it was a number beyond imagination. That's why when they try to emphasize the number beyond imagination, they say 1,000, 1,000. So they times the two biggest numbers at the time, and they say that's how much is a lot at that particular time. So when they say go, when the Prophet says go as far as China, it's trying to give us an example that you have to travel till the end of means to gain knowledge, giving us an importance of it. The second that we can look at from the Prophet ﷺ, when he looks at knowledge, he says there's no time frame in which you can gain knowledge. From the cradle to the grave, your lifespan should be an ongoing journey in which we will gain knowledge, acquire knowledge, 
Now, the question that lies that inshallah will answer tonight and tomorrow night is what type of knowledge do they refer to? As in when the Prophet says, go and acquire knowledge, is he categorizing it in a specific, specific angle? Is he, character, is he character, characterizing it in a particular school? Or is it a vast majority in which you can encompass knowledge, educate yourself, grow? We'll look at that tomorrow, inshallah, in more detail. Now we find that Imam Ali alayhi afdal salati was salam is the door of the Prophet's knowledge. And he himself says, the Prophet of Islam has taught me 1,000 doors of knowledge. From every door, it opens another thousand. That's if you calculate, that's one million doors of knowledge from the Prophet of Islam, not anyone else. From the person that does not speak of his own accord. He speaks from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let's look at the knowledge of Ali ibn Talib later on tonight. So in the starting stage, we find that there is an importance. The Prophet had put an importance of knowledge. The second stage, has he told us how to acquire it? As in one of the things when we look at, when the Prophet mentions knowledge, is how to bring up a child. He says, make sure when you're bringing up a child, it's in three specific stages. What are the stages? He says the first seven is the first stage. The second seven is the second stage. And the final is the seven plus. The first seven, what do you do? He says, Dahum. Leave them. Let their intuition grow. Let them explore. Let them think for themselves. Do not encompass them by what society thinks. Don't encompass them by this is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. Not yet. Let them explore. Just don't let them kill themselves, obviously. Leave them in a, in, a, in a suitable place in which they can explore the world, their talents. Then when they reach seven, that age frame, you find that this is when the Prophet says, begin to teach them. Seven years of age till 14, begin to teach. This is halal. This is haram. Do we stop there? No. This is why this is halal. This is why this is haram. That's why we find many sisters come Wearing the hijab one day at a young age and you think to yourself, wow, that's beauty. That someone at such a young age can put on the scarf which embodies Islam, which is a flag of Islam. The same hijab that Fatima al-Zahra wore. The same hijab that Sayyidah Zainab stood for in the 10th of Muharram and when she was taken captive from city to city. The hijab has its representation. However, if we just tell them this is halal, this is haram, will they have the strength to keep that hijab on? Or will they begin to question themselves one day that's telling themselves that's why am I wearing it in the first place? That's why when you, we teach our children from 7 to 14, we have to teach them in depth. When we teach them, we have to tell them why Allah has made this halal. Why Allah has made this haram. So to make them see the beauty in it. What did we say yesterday about the khawarij? When they tell you a particular ruling, they say do not question. This is how Allah says it. That's what they say. That's how Allah did it. That's what Allah wants you to know. That's all Allah wants you to know. Don't question what this is, what that is, why you're doing this. This is the right way. Believe me, that's, that's how they teach. That's what makes us different. The Prophet of Islam says, make sure 7 to 14, it's an ongoing process. Teach, teach, teach. Educate. Acknowledge. Put the light of knowledge into them. That idea that you want to feed with knowledge. Feed their souls. Then he says, from 14 onwards, befriend them. Why? Because how many people do we know when they're going through adolescence? Their parents are the last people they go towards. Because there's a gap. Because from 7 four to 14, they weren't teaching them. From 7 to 14, they didn't want anything to do with them. From 7 to 14 was a very rough road between the parent and the child. However, if he's in a teaching process, in a relationship, then he says befriend them from 14 onwards, the adolescent period. Why? Because, and one of the main pivotal reasons is that they don't go towards another person, which is one of the causes of haram relationships. So they don't, don't go to another shoulder to complain, another shoulder to ask questions. You're their friend, not just their parent, not just their mentor, not just their teacher. You're also their friend. Create that bond. But we find the main idea for tonight's topic 
where the Prophet of Islam seeks to explore the idea of knowledge is to teach them. Now we know when someone acquires knowledge at a young age, it's obviously and evidently different from someone that acquires knowledge at an old age for two specific reasons. Or two reasons that I want to look at. Number one, we have the idea that if you teach someone something at a young age, it's as if you're what? You're engraving into stone at a young age. It's like you're engraving onto stone. Whatever they learn will stay with them. What's the example? Ali ibn Abi Talib says in the will to Imam Hassan, he says, I wanted to cultivate your heart at a young age. Imam Ali gives us the example that the heart, whatever you put on it, it takes. It's empty. Imagine. Imagine a white page that's empty. Whatever you write on it, you can't write on that specific place again. That's how you should feed knowledge to the young. Imam Ali says, I tried to teach you at a young age. I wanted to plant in you the seeds which will make you who you are when you are older. Which will make you who you are growing up. To have that foundation. Ali ibn Abi Talib to Imam al Hassan. That's why we find, obviously, there's a significance and an importance when you're at a younger age in learning. Because you will gain more. You will resonate more within your soul, reson resonate more within your memories. And it gives you a better chance to act upon it. Because you can imagine the older you get, the more your lifestyle is encompassed. It's, it's fixed. It's very hard to change your lifestyle into new knowledge acquired. Whether it be hadiths, whether it be a new source of knowledge which lets you, for example, read a particular dua, pray in a certain manner, extra prayers. I'm just talking about the knowledge to do with Islam. And there's other knowledges we can acquire. But it's going to be harder to change your routine. However, at a young age, in your adolescence, even younger than that, you acquire knowledge, you can act upon it. And that's also relating back to the parent-son relationship that we said earlier. Now, that's another stage to look at. Now let's look at that specific, specific point. Let's look at the knowledge that we can see and how did it affect the timeline that we have today. And what I mean is what's happened in history. Let's look at what happened in history to the concept of knowledge. How has it changed? What have we been given and what has been taken from us? And you think to yourself, has something been taken from us? Yes. The Prophet of Islam, and not many people are acknowledged to this. After the Prophet of Islam died, when we had the first, second, and third Khalif, do you know one of their actions, what, what they were? And a narration from Aisha, she says, the first thing I saw my father do when the Prophet passed away, or one of the first things. She says he has collected 500 hadiths in a narration. 500 of the narrations of the Prophet. He took them and he disposed of them. These are knowledge. These are sources of knowledge, sources of sharia. This is what we can base our religion on, the hadith of the Prophet. He says, she says he took them and he disposed of them. Why? It's a very clever plan, but look at the reply. He says, just in case someone may read them and is confused. They're the things that will give us clarity. The, the, the Prophet of Islam is the one that defines the Quran for us. The Ahlul Bayt are the ones that explain the Quran. When in Safin, you find that Muawiyah puts the Qur'ans on the spear to show that they're people of the book. Ali ibn Abi Talib, what does he say? He says, Ana al -Quran un -Natiq. I am the Qur'an. I am the manifestation. I am the talking Qur'an. He says, go look at what the Prophet has said about Muawiyah and go look at what the Prophet said about me. The person that opened his eyes in the eyes of the Prophet of Islam. That was fed from the mouth of the Prophet that grew up in the Prophet's arms. When Ali ibn Abi Talib says, not once did the wahi come, except that I know exactly what ayah it was, where it was revealed, and what it was revealed about. When Imam Ali says knowledge, it's not anything simple. I remember I was watching a documentary. It was a beautiful documentary. The other day with my brother-in-law, and we looked, at, uh, we looked upon one particular instance when they were explaining the knowledge of Ali ibn Abi Talib. When Umar comes to him, Umar says to him, 
Oh Ali, why is it that you have this much knowledge? You answer straight away. Whenever someone asks you, you answer straight away. Why? How? What's this knowledge that you have? Look at the reply of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He looks at Umar and he says, Umar, how many fingers do you have in your hand? Umar straight away says, I have five fingers. He says, how do you know that? You said, you answered quite fast, didn't you? That you have five fingers in your hand? He says, yes, of course, this is known to me. He says, that is the knowledge of what is and what is to be is known to me like your five fingers are known to you. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad. That's the door of the knowledge of the Prophet of Islam. And do you know who fought him? Who fought this great leader? Who fought the very mirror image of the Prophet of Islam? I want to show you the example of who he was fighting. When people come and defend such figures as Muawiyah in history, I want to tell you who Muawiyah used to fight with. Who was his soldiers that he brought out? A person went, a messenger from Ali ibn Abi Talib went to Syria, went to Damascus, Sham at the time. I shouldn't say Syria, because it encompassed more countries back then. He went to Sham at the time, where Muawiyah ruled from. And he had a message. He was on what we know as a naqa. Or, uh, sorry, it was on a camel, actually. A jamal. He was going towards Muawiyah. One, and they made a plan. What did they do? They said, let's take this particular messenger. Look at what they used to do to him. They said, let's tell everyone that this camel is, belongs to us and he's stolen it. Now look at the people. They take this messenger of Ali ibn Abi Talib to the courtroom. It's a really interesting story because you will begin to realize what kind of people fought Ali ibn Abi Talib. He goes towards the courtroom. He's been taken to the courtroom. The messenger of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he had a naqa with him. He says, what's your evidence? He says, this is my naqa. He says, this is my camel. He says, what's your, where's your witnesses? He says, I've come alone. I'm a messenger. He says, who's accused you of stealing their camel? He says, this person. He says, where's your witnesses? He says, tomorrow you'll have the witnesses. He says, okay, we'll make it adjourned for tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, there's 50 people. 50 people. They said, okay, let the court session come. Where's your evidence? He says, I don't have any. I've come as a messenger. He says, where's your, where's your people that will bear witness that this is your camel? He says, these are the 50 people. These people he's never seen in his life. Where did he get them from? How did, they, how did he get them? What did they <laughs> where was the bribes involved? He says, what do you guys say? He says, yes, we all bear witness that this is his camel. He said, they say, and but look at the wordings. They say, this, this camel, or this male camel, is for him. We all bear witness. So he goes, yes, 100%, there's 50 witnesses. You don't have one, I'm going to give the camel to him. Go. Imam Ali's messenger, at the time, he's thinking to himself, because there's one, that's one side, that they've bribed, They've cheated. They've used the legal system. That's one side. But that's not what he was surprised about. He goes to the judge of the time. He says, everyone bear witness that that Jamel was that person's. He says, yes. He says, that's, that's not what surprises me. I know the people that you have in your army. He says, and what surprises you? He says, this wasn't even a Jamel. It was a Naqah. He goes... Mu'awi says to him, he says, that's my message. He says, go and tell Ali ibn Abi Talib that I'm going to fight you with an army that doesn't know the difference between a naqa and a jamal. That's who the people were that fought Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's the people that fought Ali ibn Abi Talib. When we look at in history, what kind of people or what kind of people the Prophet says will fight against Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ya Ali... Or he tells Ammar, he says to Ammar, he says, You will be killed by infidels. Meaning what? What's an infidel? What kind of knowledge does an infidel have in reference to a muali? In reference to a person of knowledge? When you reach high spiritual grounds, such as, I'll give you the examples of one of the greatest companions of Ali ibn Abi Talib and one of the greatest companions 
of Imam al Hussein. Habib ibn Mudahar comes one day and he crosses paths with Maytham al Tamar. Look at the conversation that they have. Maytham al Tamar looks at Habib ibn Mudahar. Habib ibn Mudahar looks at Maytham al Tamar and their horses, their heads intermingle and they begin to talk to one another. Look at what they say. Look at what kind of knowledge the followers of Ahl al Bayt have. Maytham looks at Habib ibn Mudahar. What does he say? He says, it's as if I see one day a man that has two locks of hair going and defending the Imam of his time, being beheaded and his head roaming in the streets tied to a horse while the horse's knees hit that head. And the people are listening. People are listening. And then... And then to Maytham al Tamar, Habib ibn Mudahar says, It's as if I see a person whose origin was from a Persian background, taken, his limbs being taken off, his hands and his feet, and he's been taken on and wrapped on a tree. And after three days, his stomach will be pieced and he will die. That's the conversation that they had. And they go their separate ways. These people, what did they say? The people that normal, don't know the knowledge, don't know what these people are talking about, don't know their high status. One of them says, look at these people. We've never seen anyone lie as much as these people. They're the biggest liars in our days. That's what they said. Who comes? One of the other companions of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But this person, everyone knew was truthful because whatever he prophesied came true. Whatever he prophesied came true. They came and asked him. They said to him, who's just come past? He s they say to them, they say to him, they say such and such, may them at Tamar and Haibn al He says, may Allah be pleased with them. He says, what do you mean? He says, they're great companions with great spiritual levels, great educational values, great knowledge. He says, we think that they're the biggest liars of the time. He says, why do you say they're liars? He says, one of them said such and such. The other said such and such. He says, Sadaqu. He says, excuse me. He says, yes. Such and such person will die in that manner. Such and such person will die in that manner. And he says, I will give you an extra bit of information. He says, the companion of Aba Abdullah, and he was referring to Habib ibn Amadha, he says, the person that will carry his head will be given an extra 25 Coins extra. Why? Because he was wrapped to a horse, not held on a spear. What kind of level do you have to reach to gain the knowledge of your death? Maytham al Tamar, when he found out that Ali ibn Abi Talib told him, when he told him, you will be taken and your limbs cut off and taken on that tree, and he pointed at it. What did Maytham al Tamar used to do? He used to go and water that particular tree. Because he's like, this is where I'm going to die. He waters that tree. He goes and goes towards that tree. He remembers death near that tree. But he had the knowledge. Why? Because Ali ibn Talib referred it to him. That's the door of knowledge, the importance of knowledge. And tomorrow, inshallah, we'll discuss in detail how an elevated level of spirituality, an elevated level of religiosity and closeness towards Allah will allow Allah to put knowledge into your heart. It's not just the knowledge that we acquire. It's the knowledge that Allah gives us. However, we know that from Imam al-Sadiq, that knowledge that we have nowadays, look at what he refers to. He says, everything you have nowadays from knowledge, he says, it was one letter from us that wasn't even complete. One letter. Everything we have nowadays. One letter. Alifin ghayra That's what he says, Imam al-Sadiq. He says, because at the, the back then, when we find the alphabet in Kufic writing, it was an alif and it had a line under it, known as ma'tufa. He it says, it's as if an alif, but it's not complete. That's what you have from our knowledge. And it was seeped. And you can look the first, second, third khalifas, the hadiths were not there. They were taken away. They were burnt. The message of the Prophet burnt, taken away. There was a massive loophole where knowledge ceased to exist except the knowledge which they wanted to be preached. That's why we have people such as Abu Huraira, etc. at the time.
But even in the time of Abu Bakr, after he used Abu Hurairah, we find Umar ibn al-Khattab begins to whip Abu Hurairah in the 50th year after, Hijra, after the death of the Prophet. He begins to whip Abu Hurairah and he says, stop fabricating a hadith. But no one looks at that particular hadith. They say, no, Abu Hurairah. That's a topic for a different night, inshallah. But inshallah, we want to focus on tonight and we end on this note that there is a huge significance, there's a significance and an importance to acquiring knowledge and how it may be utilized. Today was the beginning stages. Tomorrow I want to look at the depth of knowledge. Tomorrow I want to look at what knowledge the Imams had. Tomorrow I want to look at what kind of knowledge we can attain. I want to look at the knowledge that, the, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled in the mirror reflections that he had on earth. When a person comes to Ali ibn Abi Talib and he asks him a question that we can't even comprehend back then. They say, oh Ali, in our books, and these were monks, in our books we are told of a source of water that is not from the heavens nor the earth. If you tell us this, we'll come towards your religion. Water, not from the earth, not from the skies. What does Ali ibn Abi Talib say? Because this will shock you. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, the sweat of a horse. The sweat of a horse, no sodium concentrate, pure water. Who takes that? Scientists nowadays in 2000, I believe 7, 2008, and they analyzed the sweat of a horse. They found no sodium concentrate, which makes it what? Water. Now, there's hygienic, obviously, things that we have to look at, but in essence, it's pure water. Another person comes and says, oh, Ali trying to stop him from Salah. Because Ali was going towards Salah. On the way, he says, he was a Jewish man. He says, oh Ali, can you tell, or can you categorize which animals give birth and which animals lay eggs? Ali ibn Talib is on his way towards the mosque. Nowadays, we have evolution theory, which is all fabrication upon fabrication. And we have the I ideas that, and the concept that are given on this animal and this species and this Genes will cause this person to give birth and this person to let. Imam Ali, what does he say? Categorizes it, one, two words. He says, any animal that has a physical E gives birth. Anyone doesn't have a physical E lays eggs. Think about it. Food for thought. And he walks. Ali Talib walks away. Scientists take that. I believe 2010, 2011. They said the only exception to Ali ibn Abi Talib's ruling was the whale. They said it gives birth, but we cannot see the physical E. A couple of months later, they said no. The whale has a physical E. Sadaq Ali. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ahmed. InshaAllah, tonight will be the first of two night series in the concept of knowledge. We pray to Allah, inshaAllah, on an ending note for tonight's lecture, that Allah elevates us in knowledge and lets us apply it to our lives. Because it's not enough having knowledge, brothers and sisters. We have to apply it. That's where the importance lies. Because the people that fought Ali had knowledge of Ali. The people that fought Hussein, Imam Hussein, alayhi Abdul Salam, had knowledge of Imam Hussein, didn't have the application in their daily lives. So we pray to Allah that Allah elevates us in knowledge and gives us a tawfiq in which we can apply it to our lives. We pray to Allah this particular dua and we end with a surah al-mubarakah al-fatiha but before it three of your loudest salawat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad